Yep, sorry. All right, so uh, yeah, uh, thanks uh, everybody for coming. You've heard a lot about Group J and K resistance uh, as mentioned today by a couple of the other presenters, Chris. And uh, yeah, I just want to give a little bit more of a rundown about my PhD topic. Uh, the, obviously the uh, concerns that this uh, places on the current chemicals that we have available to control ryegrass. So I just thought I'd show, start with this, you know, it's a good uh, you know, illustration of, uh, of what, we're, what we're dealing with here. So across the top I've got three populations, I've got a population uh, which uh, two are from the York Peninsula, uh, from the uh, South Australian region, one from New South Wales, and then here uh, on the right we've, uh, we've got the susceptible. So these are all uh, full label rates of the uh, Group J herbicides uh, and obviously the untreated. So in this case you can see that neither of these herbicides have, have provided any level of control other than in this case of the, the S. So you've seen these graphs, but I want to talk a little bit more about um, some of the other populations that I'm, that I'm dealing with. So uh, the susceptible here, obviously the label rate, uh, we get full control as seen in the previous slide. Uh, and the individual populations uh, in this case for prosulfocarb exhibit quite significant levels of survival uh, or 50% survival at these much higher um, rates. So you know, in, in uh, this population from New South Wales, you know, the LD50, uh, to, to kill 50 or control 50% of the population, you know, up around the 15 and a half thousand grams of AI. So really significant levels of resistance. Obviously the others uh, follow a uh, fairly similar suite. The same for triolate, and I think what's interesting to note here is, is there, there are very consistent levels of resistance within the group J's. Again, you know, the uh, susceptible controlled here, and again, we're needing up around that sort of six to 8,000 grams of AI to control 50% of these populations. So then, uh, unexpectedly, I guess, we, when I was doing this work and, and looking at these uh, resistant populations, uh, I thought, well, because we're screening with J's and we're screening with K's in random weed surveys, we should see, well, what, you know, other, level, what other resistance exists within these um, populations. So here I've um, again shown, I've got my three untreated, and I treated with uh, Butasan, Outlook, and Jewel Gold. Uh, and again, high levels of survival, probably not as vigorous um, and as many individuals surviving as you saw with the J's. But again, our susceptibles here is uh, a comparison to show that these herbicides are in fact uh, working. So for uh, metazaclor, butasan, uh, again, uh, these, um, these populations uh, exhibit a, a high level of resistance in comparison to the S. But what you must also notice, I guess, is the fact that the level of resistance, so the, the uh, concentration or the amount of herbicide required to kill these uh, populations or 50% of these populations is much lower than that observed with the J's. Now I haven't really explained much detail what this um, population RAC1 is. So RAC1 is a, uh, it was a susceptible, it was a million susceptible ryegrass seeds which were exposed to a high rate of uh, triolate, um, so four times the um, field rate. There were three survivors of that which were recurrently selected. And what's interesting, and I should have pointed out back in the J, is that after that single recurrent selection, those individuals exhibited a very high level of resistance to the J's, but interestingly, are actually controlled with uh, you know, the, the K herbicides. And the same can be said for um, peroxisulfone. So these three populations, 100 grams uh, of AI, the uh, recommended uh, field rate, and you know, individual. This obviously this population here has quite a low level of resistance, but again, we're getting populations here which are, you know, we're needing well over the recommended field rate to get 50% control. And again, this selected population um, is. Uh, controlled at the, at the label rate. So 
what does this actually mean, I guess, in regards to how we manage these populations going forward? So it was really unexpected to see such high levels of uh, resistance to the Js, but obviously also to the group K chemistries. And you know, a lot of this can be resulted on you know, trifluralin resistance initially, uh, and then this strong use, as we've seen uh, today um, in Navneet's uh, presentation, where growers that selected with recurrent use of proxasulfone or um, any of the Js saw this strong selection pressure and subsequently the evolution of group J resistance. So again, for as I've mentioned, this um, population, uh, this single selected population, displays only resistance to the Js, which gives us a bit of an insight into how this resistance actually works uh, as well. So at this moment in time, I have uh, confirmed five populations uh, that have cross resistance both to the Js and the Ks. And that also includes um, you know, resistance to uh, other um, pre-emergent herbicides such as uh, trifluralin. So I don't want to get too bogged down in this because this is, this is the, the next stage, you know, trying to understand what's actually happening um, from a biochemical side of uh, you know, enzymatic activity, that type of thing. But I just wanted to touch on it because we are doing work. We want to actually understand what's happening. Uh, so what's really uh, interesting about the group J's is they actually require activation within the plant. So the herbicide on its own is, provides no uh, herbicidal effect whatsoever. It has to go into the plant. It's converted through these enzymes called P450s, cytochrome P450s, and it's, it's formed, it forms, a, through that process, it forms this toxic uh, sulfoxide compound, which is the actual herbicidal uh, compound that causes the, the inhibition of, of uh, plant um, growth. So, again, we're questioning, you know, what influence is this reduced activation happening? So is the herbicide going in, it's not being activated and subsequently not providing herbicidal effects? Uh, these are things we still need to tease out in the coming year. So, again, reiterating what you've heard today, this evolution of cross resistance is a really significant concern to the industry because we've also heard, and, and I've shown through my work, which I haven't shown today, but is the resistance evolution to new modes of action that haven't even yet come to market. Now, that's really concerning because ultimately, we have products that we intend to use to control these ryegrass populations, but they've already evolved this diverse resistance mechanism, which ultimately uh, sees every other mode of action that comes onto the market, uh, you know, struggle to control these, these populations. So, um, again, more work we will intend to do, which is on this Group J um, herbicide activation, the influence that that plays, uh, and what we've what's seen in the literature so far is that um, peroxisulfone resistance, and this is in a recurrently selected population, not a field evolved. I should emphasise that that all of the populations I've shown you today, they're all field evolved populations, other than I mean RAC1, which again it's recurrent selection through high herbicide selection, but again shows that this evolution of group J resistance, it, it doesn't take much. So again, it's been hypothesized that, yeah, the mechanism, or was hypothesized that the mechanism of group K resistance, in this case peroxisulfone, was similar to that of wheat, and, uh, and that has, has been confirmed. But of course, we don't yet know if that uh, is reflected in the populations uh, that um, I'm working on. So, thank you. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the GRDC, the University of Adelaide, and RRM for the opportunity to speak to you all today. So, thanks very much. <laughs>